Hello YouTube! In this video I'm going to explore some sceptical challenges concerning memory. Uh, I'm using the term memory, broadly speaking, to refer to the faculty by which we store and retrieve data. Almost all of the knowledge that we take ourselves to have is dependent in some way on memory. Uh, if we had access only to present experience, we could know very little about the world. Um, so we generally assume that memory is reliable. But why should we believe this? This is the sceptical challenge. What grounds do we have for trusting that memory is reliable? Well, uh, let's begin by considering a, a, a sort of very simple argument that might initially occur. So I might think, OK, it's easy to show that memory is reliable. Um, many times in the past, I have consulted my memory. And in those cases, my memory has been reliable. So generally speaking, my memory does not deceive me. The, the information provided by my memory tends to be corroborated by other sources. Uh, for example, there have been many instances where I remembered that some event X happened, and then other people who were there concurred that X happened. We all talked about the event and our stories matched. Perhaps some people produced photographs of the event. Similarly, there have been many instances when I revised for an exam, that I took the exam and I received high marks. That shows that I retained the correct information for the exam. So, you know, in these cases, right, like I'm, I'm relying on my capacity for memory and, you know, it's, it's worked. By contrast, there have been relatively few instances where my memory has been shown to be mistaken. So I have many instances of accurate memory, relatively few instances of, instances of inaccurate memory, and that's just to say that my memory is reliable. Well, there's an obvious problem with this simple argument. Uh, it's circular. The conclusion is that memory is reliable, but the argument uses memory in order to get to that conclusion. Uh, I can only enumerate all of these instances of successful memory by remembering those instances. So the argument presupposes that which it is supposed to demonstrate. It presupposes the reliability of memory. Because, you know, so like suppose that I'm agnostic about the issue. Suppose I do not yet accept the reliability of memory. Well, clearly then, I'm not going to trust the purported examples of times in the past that my memory delivered correct information. I can only accept those examples once the reliability of memory has been established. Um, so looks like this argument is, uh, is circular. So this is, is, is the challenge, right? This is the challenge of memory skepticism. Um, what grounds do we have for trusting that memory is reliable? Uh, and of course, if it turns out that we have no grounds for, for this, if we are not justified in thinking that memory is reliable, then it looks like a huge amount of our knowledge um, just disappears. You know, there's, there's actually very, very, very little that we can know. Um, because almost everything that I take myself to know, uh, memory is involved. You know, I remember reading it in a book or, you know, I remember experiencing it or something like that. There's very little that I know just through present experience. Okay, so let's look at some, uh, some responses to memory skepticism. Well, the first response simply accepts that the justification of memory reliability is circular, but it denies that circularity is a problem in this case. So the idea here is that not all forms of circular argument are viciously circular. There is benign circularity. So this response is favoured by Andrew Moon in his article, Skepticism and Memory. Moon grants that in defending the reliability of memory, I must appeal to data drawn from memory, but he doesn't think this is a problem. So the question is then, under, what's, under what conditions is circularity problematic? Well, here's what Moon says. If prior to the formation of the epistemically circular belief that faculty F is reliable, the believer already seriously doubted or should have been seriously doubting the reliability of F, then this, fact that this circularity is malignant. But of course, in other cases, it's not a big deal. Uh, so that is a circular argument that uses a faculty in defense of the reliability of that same faculty is problematic only if we already seriously doubt the reliability of that faculty. So suppose, for example, somebody believes that the Bible is infallible and 
when asked why they think the Bible is infallible, they say, you know, because it's been directed by an omnipotent, omniscient God who would not deceive us. And why do they believe it was directed by an omnipotent, omniscient God who would, who would not deceive us? Well, because it says so in the Bible. Clearly, that's a bad argument. And the trouble with this argument is that there are plenty of serious grounds on which to doubt the reliability of the Bible. We know it was written by human beings living in a particular culture. Human beings are prone to making all sorts of mistakes, right? We just know that. And, and like everybody knows that, even people who are Christians who accept the reliability of the Bible will accept that human beings in general are very flawed and often make mistakes. Um, we know that the Bible is one among many religious texts, all of which make different claims. We know that it contains claims that conflict with other well-established beliefs. For instance, it, you know, well, arguably it conflicts with various claims well-established in modern science etc, etc, right? So the, the thought is, well, we have plenty of grounds to doubt the reliability of the Bible, so we can't, you know, we can't use the Bible to establish its own reliability. That's a case of vicious circularity. But by contrast, um, I don't seriously doubt that my memory is reliable. Um, I start my inquiries by simply trusting my faculty, right? By trusting the, the faculty for memory. Um, you, you know, so like prior to philosophical inquiry, I will appeal to memory indiscriminately, and the question of the reliability of memory never arises. So then when the skeptic comes along and asks, you know, is memory reliable? Right? What justification is there for thinking memory is reliable? Well, since I do not seriously doubt its reliability in the first place, I can use memory itself to recall past instances of successful memory, and then this justifies my belief that memory is reliable. Now, this is circular, but there's an important sense in which it doesn't beg the question against the memory sceptic. And this is because the use of memory does not in itself presuppose that memory scepticism is mistaken. And that's because there isn't any guarantee that memory would be self-supporting. So there's no guarantee that when I consult memory for past instances of successful memory, there's no guarantee that I would recall a preponderance of such instances. I might instead recall being systematically deceived by memory. So maybe I just end up remembering loads and loads of cases where, you know, what I thought I remembered was completely incorrect. Um, and, and, you know, this does happen occasionally, right? I can remember um, playing with my grandfather on my mother's side. Right? But that cannot possibly have occurred because he died before I was born. So, you know, like it might be the case that when I remember these past instances of appealing to memory, almost all of them turned out to be deceiving. Memory could, could have turned out to be unreliable by its own lights. So when I consult my memory and find that actually it's reliable by its own lights, that is a significant result. So, is this convincing? Well, obviously one concern here is that you know, there's going to be a lot of controversy about um, the view of circularity given here. So, you know, Moon's view is that provided I do not seriously doubt the reliability of a faculty, then an argument for the reliability of that of the faculty, which uses that faculty, that does provide justification. Circularity is not a problem in that case. So, I mean, one obvious move for the memory skeptic is just to question whether this circularity is in fact acceptable. Um, but suppose we accept Moon's view. There are further problems here. So um, remember that Moon grants that if prior to forming the belief that memory is reliable, I seriously doubt that memory is reliable, then it's viciously circular to presuppose that memory is reliable in coming to form the belief, right? Circularity is inappropriate where there are serious doubts. But now we might argue that, well, actually, I can and I should seriously doubt that memory is reliable. And there are, there are a few things that might um, lead to these doubts. So first of all, I have plenty of what we might call ordinary cases of memory misleading me. So I can remember past cases where my memories turned out to be wrong. I can remember reading psychological studies about the remarkable flexibility of memory, about how memory often involves something more like telling and retelling stories that manifest in different ways in different contexts, rather than the simple retention of information. So 
you know, I know that even by that, that even by its own lights, memory is sometimes wrong, right? I mean, there's no question about that. Nobody doubts that memory is sometimes wrong, but then that immediately raises the question: Well, how often is it wrong? So, like, if I, you know, as soon as I reflect on my own on my memories, as soon as I, you know, think, okay, memory is sometimes misleading. That's going to raise the question: How often is it misleading? And maybe it's systematically deceiving. Um, now, of course, re reflecting on these ordinary cases does not establish that memory is systematically unreliable. But that's not the point. The point is just that once I reflect on these ordinary cases of my memories misleading me, it seems that, you know, if I'm to be epistemically responsible, I will have to at least raise the question of whether memory is reliable. Right? I, I now have doubt, right? Like that's, that's all I need, right? Once I have doubt, um, then on Moon's view of circularity, it's not going to be appropriate to use memory to defend the reliability of memory. And it seems that these ordinary cases of memory misleading me do create grounds for doubt. Then second, uh, a second kind of ground for doubt is that there are numerous skeptical hypotheses concerning memory. Consider the five-minute world hypothesis. It's logically possible that the universe in its entirety came into existence just five minutes ago. Right? This is entirely consistent with my present experiences. Um, so on, on this hypothesis, on the five-minute world hypothesis, I would have exactly the same apparent memories um, because like my brain, the exact arrangement of atoms and everything, that, came, that just popped into existence five minutes ago. Um, there is no way to distinguish on the basis of empirical evidence alone, the, you know, the common sense hypothesis that the world has existed for billions of years from the um, five minute hypothesis that it popped into existence just five minutes ago. And of course, there's an indefinite variety of skeptical hypotheses like this. There is the evil demon hypothesis, which claims that a super powerful evil demon intent on deceiving me has implanted false memories into my mind, and there's no past corresponding to these memories. Again, my present experience is consistent with this hypothesis. Now, if any of these sceptical hypotheses are true, memory is not reliable. But my present experiences don't, you know, they don't show that these hypotheses are false. And so again, you know, reflection on hypotheses like this, it raises doubts about whether memory is reliable. Again, the point here is not to demonstrate that memory is unreliable, I mean, maybe in the end, there are good responses to these skeptical hypotheses. The point of, prevent of presenting such hypotheses is just to raise doubts, right? And once we've raised those doubts, then on Moon's own view, the circularity in the argument for the reliability of memory is no longer benign. Um, so, uh, you know, there may well be uh, obviously other views of sort of circularity and when it's appropriate and inappropriate, but um, yeah. Uh, at least on, on Moon's view, it arguably seems that uh, memory scepticism stands. Um, so the question then is, okay, uh, if, if memory, if, if, if there's not, you know, going, if we're not going to be able to argue for benign circularity, can we demonstrate the reliability of memory in a non-circular way? So can we demonstrate the reliability of memory without appealing to data retrieved from memory? Well, there are several possibilities here. So a second defense of memory is confirmation by predictions. The basic idea uh, of this response is that I can use my present mental states to confirm predictions that are made on the basis of memory, and this provides some justification for thinking that memory is reliable. Uh, this is suggested by uh, Roy Harrod in his article Memory. He says, and I quote, I may predict continuity for the ordinary objects around me, and the prediction may be fulfilled within one present totality. And if a flash of lightning occurs, I may predict and experience its end within the same totality. So like right now, for instance, I have a memory of past observations of placing my feet on the wooden floor. As far as I recall, each time I did this, the floor supported my weight. I didn't drop through the floor. So, okay, now I wonder whether my memory is reliable. So I propose the hypothesis that memory is reliable and I make the prediction that this time the floor will support my weight, right? Just as it supported my weight every other, you know, I remember it supporting my weight the other time, so this time it will support my weight. And as it turns out, 
it does support me. The prediction is confirmed. Or I have memories of seeing a flash of lightning end quickly. I wonder whether my memory is reliable. Then in my current experience, I see a flash of lightning which ends quickly. And that can, you know, that confirms that my memory is indeed reliable. Um, indeed, you know, in fact, it's like the, the, the very ability to make these predictions, like I'm drawing these predictions, um, requires me to kind of like have to assume the reliability of memory. So the success of these predictions confirms the reliability of memory. Like I'm using the rely, I'm using my memory, I'm using the reliability of my memory to make these predictions. So this, when these predictions are confirmed, right, that seems to support the reliability of my memory. And my current perceptual states are going to confirm many predictions of this sort. Okay, um, some objections to this argument. So I, I said that my present experience will confirm many predictions of this sort, but mm, that's uh, uh, perhaps unreasonably optimistic. So remember that if we are to avoid circularity, um, the only thing, the only thing that I can appeal to is what is available in the immediate present moment. And that is extremely limited. I think it allows for, at best, only one or two correct predictions of memory. So it's worth really thinking about just how tricky it is to get even one correct memory prediction in the present moment. What is required is that I formulate the hypothesis that my memory is reliable, that I remember certain past experiences, that I relate those apparent past experiences to my present experiences, such that a prediction about those present experiences can be made and then tested. Right? All of that needs to be part of my present mental experience. It's worth actually like tr trying to do this. Right? Just so like take um, Roy Harrod's two predictions concerning physical object continuity and the flash of lightning. Right? Like try to keep your attention on both of those hypotheses and the predictions they make, and then test those predictions all in a single present moment. That's that's really tough. So the problem then is that, well, okay, it looks like maybe we've got a single correct prediction, but a single correct prediction provides very little justification for the reliability of memory. Uh, I mean, there may be some circumstances where a single correct prediction provides good support to a theory, but I mean, this doesn't seem to be one of them. So, I mean, consider for instance, general relativity's prediction of the value of light bending around the sun. That was, that was, a, that was a pretty triumphant sort of prediction. That was, that was a pretty remarkable prediction. But this prediction was surprising, it was extremely precise, and, and it could have, you know, it was tested by precise sort of means, uh, precise instruments. It was, in particular, it was able to distinguish general relativity from the relevant competitor theories. Newtonian mechanics gave a different prediction for the value of light bending around the sun. Um, these points don't seem to be true for the predictions made on the basis of memory, right? Like the, the, these, when we make these predictions from memory, they're kind of merely qualitative. They're compatible with the alternative skeptical hypotheses. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not such a precise, sophisticated prediction that clearly distinguishes uh, the memory reliability hypothesis from other hypotheses. Um, and actually, even with uh, the case of general relativity, there were many other factors um, that supported it. It's, uh, it's unlikely that the theory would have been accepted merely on the basis of just that one correct prediction. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the point is, is that, you know, the, the sort of single correct predictions that we get from memory um, don't seem to provide much justification for memory reliability. A second objection to Harrod's argument is that using Harrod's procedure, we can find present experiences that confirm hypotheses incompatible with the reliability of memory. Uh, this point is made by Sven Bernicke in his book, The Metaphysics of Memory. So um, let's, let's just sort of think about exactly how ha Harrod's procedure is supposed to work. Uh, let's remind ourselves, right? So as far as I recall, I have been looking at the computer screen for the past 10 minutes, say. So we have this hypothesis. The hypothesis is, I have been looking at my computer screen for the past 10 minutes. I'm, I'm drawing this hypothesis from what I apparently remember. Now, I, I, I take it that the only evidence that can be used is present perceptual experiences. 
So from this hypothesis, I predict that I will continue to see a computer screen, right? And well, in my present experience, I find that I do indeed see a computer screen. So the reliability of memory is confirmed. Or so it seems. Because now consider some alternative hypotheses. So consider the hypothesis, I have been looking at my computer screen for one hour. Well, from this, I'm going to make the same prediction that, you know, I'll that I will continue to, to see a computer screen, that a computer screen will be in my present experience. So this hypothesis is also confirmed by my present experience. I mean, so, you know, I mean, and clearly there's a whole bunch of other hypotheses that I could propose, right? My present perceptual experiences provide just as much support for the claim that I've been looking at my computer screen for 11 minutes or for 20 minutes or for over a week, right? Um, if any of these hypotheses are true, then my memory would be deceptive in this case. So, so yes, I have a memory of looking at my computer screen for the past 10 minutes, and from this I predict that the computer screen will be in my present experience now. It is there now, so the prediction is confirmed. But I could just as well have chosen the hypothesis that I've been looking at a computer screen for one hour, in which case my memory is misleading, and I get the same prediction. So the fact that my computer screen continues to be there doesn't seem to confirm that things happened as I remember them happening. Um, or maybe another way to put this is, if confirming the hypothesis that I've been looking at my computer screen for 10 minutes supports memory reliability, wouldn't confirming these alternative hypotheses challenge memory reliability? But there are an indefinite variety of such alternatives. Right, like, and again, we're just talk. We're just use. If if we're trying to avoid circularity, we're just using present experience here, right? So, like, you know, what's wrong with going for that with this hypothesis that I've been looking at my computer screen for over one hour, right? Um, you know, like, what I can just equally well assume that my memory is misleading. I take that hypothesis, and I get the same prediction. Um, so it seems that even if we uh, can use Harrod's procedure, the problem is we're going to get, you know, there's going to be a whole load of hypotheses which uh, are, are just incompatible with the reliability of memory, which are equally well confirmed by present experience. Okay, a third option for, de for defending memory is inference to the best explanation. So um, again, I begin with my immediate present experiences and then the claim is that my present experiences exhibit features that call for explanation, and the best explanation for those features is that memory is reliable. So it's an inference to the best explanation. Uh, inference to the best explanation is a very common form of inference. In general, the idea is I start by noticing some puzzling phenomenon, and then I generate hypotheses that could explain the phenomenon, and then I infer to the hypothesis that scores the best in terms of the theoretical virtues or the explanatory virtues. So, uh, you know, we, these will be things like simplicity, uh, fewest unanswered questions, coherence with background beliefs, predictive power, and so on. So, for example, uh, suppose one day I hear scratching sounds in the walls of my house, I hear the patter of feet at night, uh, I find bite marks in my food and furnishings. How is this to be explained? Well, I'll probably infer that there is a mouse in my house. Um, this explains the data, and it provides a better explanation than the other possible explanations. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a fairly simple hypothesis. It's internally coherent. It fits well with my background beliefs because I know how mice behave. I know that mice often get into people's houses. It doesn't really, uh, you know, leave me with any. Uh, puzzle, with any sort of new puzzles. I mean, I guess I can ask, like, how did the mouse get in? But actually, that's quite easy to explain. There's all sorts of ways mice can get into houses. And again, like, I know this. This is just part of my background beliefs. So there's not a lot of unanswered questions raised by this explanation. Um, it has good predictive power because it allows me to make predictions about what I will observe if I perform actions such as laying down mouse traps. Now, there are other explanations that uh, are also that also could explain this data. So for example, I might suppose that all of these disturbances are caused by ghosts. But like that's a bad explanation because if I postulate ghosts, well, this requires inflating my ontology. You know, now I now I'm postulating entities that 
don't really fit well with my background understanding of the world. Um, like, like nobody, like what, like how, how could ghosts exist? Uh, for one thing, um, nor is it clear why or how a ghost would behave in this way. Like, why would a ghost chew on food? And how would the spiritual substance of the ghost interact with matter? Um, and like again, what I mean, what predictions can I make? How how do I know anything about how ghosts would behave? You know, so the mouse hypothesis seems to be clearly the superior explanation. In uh, you know, by these uh, by these virtues, so that is the one that I infer is true. All right, so that's inference to the best explanation. And the thought is the same kind of move can be made for memory. The data in this case are just my present experiences of perception and introspection. So I'm currently undergoing sensory experiences of the world and that I can also introspect and I find that I have various beliefs, including beliefs about the past. So I have sensory experiences and I have apparent memories. And there is a remarkable continuity and coherence to this present experience. My beliefs about the past cohere in an interesting way with my present perceptual data. Uh, for example, I have the apparent memory of sitting at my computer 10 minutes ago. I have no memory of moving away from the computer. And in the present moment, I find myself sitting at a computer and so on for a host of other apparent memories plus sensory data, right? Like, and, th and this coherence calls for explanation. What, why is present experience coherent in this way? Right? What, what's responsible for this coherence? Well, at least part of the explanation might be this. I have interacted with the world in the past. I have formed memories as a result, and these memories are generally reliable. So memory is reliable. Now, maybe there are other explanations for the coherence of present experience, but the defender of memory reliability is going to argue that this explanation um, scores better in terms of simplicity, coherence, explanatory power, and so on. Okay, so a first objection is that giving an IBE giving an inference to the best explanation arguably requires the use of memory because inference to the best explanation is is a tricky argument, right? Like there are several steps that are involved. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm gonna need a set of data to be explained, right? I'm, I'm gonna need the sort of puzzling phenomenon. Second, I need to have some theory of the explanatory virtues. So when I make an inference of the best explanation, I need some criteria for figuring out how to rank competing explanations. Now I've suggested some of these criteria. There's simplicity, coherence, you know, a coherence of background beliefs, um, fewest unanswered questions, predictive power. But I mean, all of these are quite vague. <laughs> They're open to interpretation. Um, you know, there, there are many different kinds of simplicity, for instance, many ways that philosophers and scientists have defined simplicity. Which of these kinds of simplicity, if any, is indicative of truth? Um, you know, a, a, I mean, similar point can be made for, for all of the proposed explanatory virtues. It is very controversial how they are to be understood. And third, once I've figured out exactly what the explanatory virtues are and how they are to be understood, I must then generate alternative explanations and weigh the virtues of each explanation. It is not always going to be immediately obvious which theory performs the best overall. So, um, you know, I've, I, we've already presented uh, two alternative theories for explaining present experience. There is the five minute world hypothesis and the evil demon hypothesis. Now, the defender of memory reliability will want to say um, that her hypothesis scores better on the explanatory virtues than these hypotheses do. But, I mean, does it? Is that just, I mean, that is certainly not just obvious. So like, take the evil demon hypothesis. Well, the evil demon hypothesis involves an ontology consisting of only two minds, right? There's your mind, and then there is the mind of the demon deceiving you, right? That's it, that's all you need for the evil demon hypothesis. Now, I mean, uh, prima facie, that looks simpler than the common sense hypothesis, which postulates a whole universe containing many material objects and many minds, right? So, like, what I mean, that seems like it might score better on at least some sorts of simplicity um, than the hypothesis that entails memory is reliable. So, I mean, the point is, is this, right? I'm trying to use an inference to the best explanation on my present experience to show that 
the reliability of memory can be justified without appealing to data retrieved from memory. But now look at what is involved in giving an IBE. I need a theory of explanatory virtues. I need a set of data to be explained. I need a set of hypotheses to explain the data. I need to determine which hypothesis scores best on the explanatory virtues. Surely it's impossible to do all of that in the present moment. So we see, you know, memory skepticism <laughs> is, is particularly challenging because in order to avoid the circularity objection, the defender of memory can't appeal to sophisticated chains of reasoning, right? Any argument must be such that all of its steps can be comprehended in the present moment. Otherwise, I'm going to be relying on memory in making the argument, right? Like by the time I've got to the conclusion of the argument, the, the earlier parts of the argument are only remembered, right? Um, and so if we're initially skeptical of memory, then you're just not going to accept that argument. Um, so, you know, and, and the trouble is that it seems like any successful inference to the best explanation is going to involve fairly sophisticated chains of reasoning, right? Like, that's just going to be, I mean, it would be a very sloppy kind of inference to the best explanation that you can just comprehend all of it in the immediate present moment. Because there's, there's sort of so many moving parts, there's so many things you have to establish to get a successful inference to the best explanation. So that is one worry here. The second objection is that even if it were possible to perform the inference to the best explanation without appealing to memory, the memory skeptic might object that the data of present experience is just too weak to support the inference. Um, this is a, a point made by Andrew Moon in the article Skepticism and Memory. So again, keep in mind just how limited the data is in this case. There are very few things that I can focus my attention on in any one moment. So right now, I'm looking at my computer. I'm hearing the sounds of the birds outside. I'm feeling a minor pang of hunger. Um, I'm presented with a memory of my 10th birthday and the memory of using my computer yesterday. Maybe, maybe I could add a few things here, but actually, I mean, it's difficult to remain attentive even to just these few experiences. So I, I, may, I, you know, I gave like four or five distinct experiences. I mean, can you really hold like these five distinct experiences clearly in your mind? Can you attend to them simultaneously in one moment? I don't think I can. I don't think I can do that. Um, like, I mean, may maybe like for me, it's it's more maybe like three. <laughs> um, but like af after that, I it has to occur over time. Now, the trouble is that the explanation appealing to memory reliability that I have interacted with the world in the past and form memories as a result, and these memories are generally reliable, that is actually quite a poor explanation of this set of experiences. I mean, it's not clear that there could be a good explanation of this set of experiences because it's not clear what exactly I'm trying to explain. The available data are just too few and too disparate. The assumption of the IBE response is that there is this striking continuity and coherence to the sensory experiences and the introspective beliefs that are available in present experience. But on reflection, that doesn't seem to be the case. It's not, it's not present experience that exhibits continuity and coherence. It's rather that I have memories of my experiences exhibiting continuity and coherence over time. So this, this supposed coherence between apparent memories and sensory data is something that manifests itself over time. It's something that's remembered, right? Like the point is I can go through lots of apparent memories and I can see how they cohere with present experience, but I can only do this for one or two memories at a time. So, you know, I can't use all of that data in the IBE. I can only use my present experience, but actually in present experience, there really isn't much coherence. So there's not really anything to explain. So, um, that is, uh, is a, another challenge to the IBE response. Okay, a fourth response to memory skepticism is that uh, memory has some sort of non-inferential justification. I can know that memory is reliable, even if this is not on the basis of any kind of reasoning. Um, there are actually many views in epistemology that allow for non-inferential justification. Um, I'm going to focus on one that's become popular recently, phenomenal conservatism. Phenomenal conservatism claims that 
seemings or appearances provide defeasible justification. Uh, so more precisely, phenomenal conservatism says, if it seems to a subject S that P is true, then in the absence of defeaters, S has at least some justification for believing P. Basically, phenomenal conservatism says, it's reasonable for me to assume that things are the way they appear to be, unless I have positive reasons for doubting the appearances. And this probably does square with how we ordinarily form beliefs. So, I believe there is a computer in front of me. Why? Because it visually appears that there's a computer in front of me, and I have no particular reason for doubting this appearance. I believe that no object could be both red all over and blue all over at the same time. Why? Because when I try to imagine this scenario, it seems to me that it would be impossible. I have the, the intellectual sense um, that the presence of red rules out the simultaneous presence of blue, and I have no particular reason for doubting this appearance. Um, and similarly, I believe that memory is reliable. Why? Well, because when I think about my memories, it seems to me that they are generally accurate, and I have no particular reasons for doubting this appearance. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that these seemings are veridical, and I may be presented with evidence that undermines my belief in all of these cases. But in the absence of such reasons to doubt, we accept the way things seem. It's perfectly rational for me to just accept the way things seem. Okay then, so a first objection to this concerns um, this point about defeaters. Um, so the memory skeptic might point out that in fact there are potential defeaters for my intuition that memory is reliable and well we've already seen some of these. So I can recall many times in the past when my memories were mistaken, so by its own lights memory is sometimes misleading. Second, there are the sceptical hypotheses, such as the five minute world and the evil demon. Why do these not count as defeaters? I mean, it's so like, it seems to me, it initially seems to me that memory is reliable, but then I recall all the times in the past that my memories were mistaken, and I reflect on sceptical hypotheses like the evil demon. This makes it apparent that my seeming to remember doing various things in the past can be explained by hypotheses which entail that it is false that I did those things. And there's nothing in my present experience that allows me to rule out these alternative hypotheses. I can't rule out that my mind has created false narratives or that I'm being deceived by an evil demon. So why doesn't this count as a defeater? I mean, certainly it seems to raise doubts. Now, of course, the phenomenal conservative might say that, um, you know, the, that maybe these are defeaters, but these defeaters can themselves be defeated. So perhaps there are good reasons for thinking that false memories are created only in specific circumstances, um, uh, that memory is generally reliable otherwise. Perhaps there are good reasons for ruling out sceptical hypotheses. That's all fine, but in the context of the argument against the memory sceptic, we have a problem. The memory sceptic has presented two apparent defeaters for the justification provided by the fact that it seems to me that my memory is reliable. So now I need to give arguments to defeat those defeaters. And if I'm to, if I'm to avoid the circularity objection, um, and I mean, the whole point of this non-inferential justification response is to avoid the circularity objection. If I'm to avoid the circularity objection, then my arguments against these defeaters cannot themselves presuppose the reliability of memory. So I'm in a, a pretty difficult position here, right? Like, so suppose I try to show that false memories tend to occur only in specific circumstances, right? So like the, the you know, I mean, I've, uh, the memory skeptic kind of presents these cases of like ord ordinary cases of memory misleading me. Um, so I then try to show, no, false memories tend to occur only in specific circumstances. Well, how can I show this without appealing to memories of the times when I had false memories or without appealing to memories of reading psychological studies about false memory? I mean, that seems hopeless, right? So that's, uh, that's, that's one problem here, that in fact there are uh, defeaters. Um, a second objection questions whether it really does seem to me that my memory is reliable. So like, what, what exactly would it mean for it to seem that memory is reliable? I mean, I am at least initially inclined to endorse the proposition memory is reliable, 
But seemings are usually understood as the appearances or experiences that serve, that, that, that play the role of justifying my belief in propositions such as this. So compare, I am inclined to endorse the proposition, there is a computer in front of me. According to phenomenal conservatism, I am justified in endorsing this proposition because it visually appears that there is a computer in front of me. Similarly, I am inclined to endorse the proposition, no surface can be red and blue all over at the same time. I am justified in endorsing this proposition because there is a kind of intellectual appearance of the incompatibility of red and blue. So, I'm inclined to endorse the proposition, memory is reliable. But what are the relevant appearances concerning the reliability of memory? Well, one thing I might say here is that there are numerous instances where it seems to be the case that my memory is accurate, and relatively few instances where it seems to be the case that my memories are deceptive. So here is one instance. I seem to remember that one hour ago I ate some cereal, right? This apparent memory presents itself to me as if it were as if it were veridical. I feel as if it were veridical. I feel this very strongly. Um, and so it, it seems to be veridical. And then the thought is that there are many such seemings, right? There are many memories presented to me where those memories seem to be accurate, right? This is just what it means to say that memory, it seems that memory is reliable. And the obvious problem with this is that there aren't numerous such seemings, at least not in the present moment. In the present moment, I can't be acquainted with all of these seemings. All I can access in the present moment is just one or two memories, such that those memories seem to be accurate. But, you know, from one or two memories seeming to be accurate, it would surely be absurd to say that it seems that memory in general is reliable. I mean, because in order for a capacity to be reliable, it would have to be, it would have to generate far more accurate beliefs than inaccurate beliefs. Like, you know, or like if I encounter two specimens of what seems to be a new species of bird and both of those birds are white, I wouldn't infer that these birds generally are white, right? Like just from, you know, seeing these two specimens of it. Um, so like, so yes, okay, maybe I have one or two memories that seem to be accurate, but that doesn't mean... So it doesn't follow from this that it seems that memory is reliable. Um, so it's not entirely obvious uh, what the relevant seeming in this case actually is. Like, and, and it's not obvious on reflection that it does seem that memory is reliable. So that might be another uh, objection to the phenomenal conservative. Okay, uh, a fifth response is that memory skepticism is self-defeating. So we've noted that one of the big challenges of memory scepticism is that the defender of memory can't appeal to sophisticated argumentation because sophisticated argumentation requires reasoning over time and so that itself requires memory. Um, so you know, you're only going to trust such arguments if you already accept the reliability of memory. But we might object that this point cuts both ways. So memory scepticism entails a scepticism of complex reasoning. If I'm not justified in relying on memory, then I'm not justified in accepting any conclusions that are based on complex reasoning, because complex reasoning requires the use of memory. But notice that, arguably, memory scepticism itself relies on complex reasoning. Uh, so just, you know, again, like, think about what's involved in reasoning to the conclusion that we are not justified in supposing that memory is reliable. First, I need to have some view about what memory is. Uh, you know, I need to have some view of the distinction between memory and other cognitive capacities. And I need to understand what it would mean for memory to be reliable. Like, just how often can memory be misleading? And in what circumstances can it be misleading before I will judge that it is not reliable? Next, I need to consider the hypothesis that memory is reliable and I need to raise a sceptical challenge to this hypothesis. This will pr probably involve giving some sort of argument, a set of premises and conclusions. It, it will involve appealing to something. You know, maybe I'll appeal to data such as um, memories of cases where my memory was misleading, or maybe I'll appeal to thought experiments like the five-minute world hypothesis. This is not, this whole process, this is not something that can be done in just the present moment. So we have the result that by the memory skeptic's own lights, the argument for memory skepticism is unconvincing. It's unconvincing because by the time I reach the conclusion that memory is unreliable, 
I only remember distinguishing memory from other capacities. I only remember proposing the sceptical hypotheses. I only remember the earlier steps of the argument. If I'm a memory sceptic, I will not accept that any of these things actually occurred. I'm not going to accept that I have a good understanding of what is meant by memory. I'm not going to accept that the earlier steps of the argument were actually convincing. Um, of course, I may have the impression that I gave a convincing argument for memory scepticism, but that impression is only based on what I can remember doing. Um, like, so unless I can hold an argument in my head all in the present moment, then as a memory sceptic, I'm going to have no reason to believe that there is such an argument. Um, but the argument for memory scepticism is too complex to hold it in my head all in the present moment. So I can never actually endorse memory scepticism. I never have any reason for thinking that it's unjustified to trust memory. Okay, so um, a couple of responses. One response to this is that actually the memory sceptic doesn't need to endorse anything. Um, the memory sceptic does not claim that there's no justification for trusting memory. She simply suspends judgment and has no opinion one way or the other. Uh, as such, she doesn't need to give a positive argument for her position. Perhaps there is justification for the view that memory is reliable. Well then, okay, let's see it. Um, so like, the thought is, you know, if I start from a position where I'm just not sure whether memory is reliable, um, or if reflection on times when my memory deceived me has made me unsure whether memory is reliable, the question is then, like, what can be said to me to make me trust memory again? Um, and, like, it's in this context that, you know, we might want to give uh, an argument that tries to uh, show that memory is reliable, right? Like, so, like, all, you don't really need to give an argument for memory scepticism, right? Like, all it takes is for you to become unsure about whether memory is reliable and at that point you're going to look for an argument to justify it. Um, so uh, a second response is that let's suppose that memory scepticism is self-defeating um, so that is the argument for memory scepticism cannot be endorsed by memory skeptics. Well what this means is that the memory skeptic is presenting arguments that by her own lights are unconvincing but it's not obvious how that helps those of us who trust memory because even if an argument is convincing to the person is even if an argument is unconvincing to the person giving the argument it may still cause trouble for the recipients of the argument so let's say i'm talking to a utilitarian although she endorses utilitarianism she behaves much like an average person she gives uh, relatively little money to charity she's mostly focused on improving her own life I then argue to her that the principles of utilitarianism obligate her to give away almost all of her money to charity. She's obligated never to purchase any luxuries for herself. Any money that is not spent on necessities like food and clothes should be given to charity. So I'm arguing that utilitarianism is far more demanding than she realises. Now, I'm not a utilitarian. I don't draw conclusions about what I ought and ought not to do based on what maximizes happiness for the greatest number of people. So for me, this, ha this argument has no force whatsoever, but that's irrelevant. My argument still presents a challenge to her worldview. And so, you know, by, like by a similar light, right? Like by, so along similar lines, right? The, the argument for memory skepticism may well be completely unconvincing to the memory skeptic. Um, but I mean, it doesn't really matter who, it, who is giving an argument, right? Um, if there is a challenge to, uh, to the reliability of memory, well, that will stand, uh, regardless of who is making the challenge. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, it's, so yeah, um, it, it seems like self you know, saying that memory skepticism is self-defeating um, isn't really going to be enough. <laughs> it's not going to be enough to actually answer the challenge, or so the objection will go. Okay, that's it. Uh, for today. Thank you for watching.